The charred aftermath of a wildfire fueled by extreme heat. These were once lush forests in southwestern France, but this is now what remains. Badly burned trees, charred ground, in some places, mostly ash. The flames have torn through more than 50,000 acres of land, and more than 35,000 people in the area have been evacuated from their homes. Wildfires are also being fueled in the south, where some states have experienced days of record-breaking triple-digit temperatures. More than 100 million Americans are under excessive heat warnings and advisories once again. The dangerous heat is now hitting the northeast, and it could stretch through the week and into next week. Rob Marciano is timing it all out. As the country heats up, President Biden takes action on climate change. He signed several executive actions, calling it an existential threat, as well as a clear and present danger, but he didn't declare it a national emergency. Our Terry Moran joins us with the details. The January 6th committee prepares for tomorrow's prime time hearing. John Carl has the latest on what to expect from the presentation and the testimony from former Trump aides. Ukraine's first lady makes an emotional plea to Congress for more U.S. aid in her country's war with Russia. Olena Zelenska received a standing ovation at the Capitol before delivering her speech, focusing on its impact on the people, highlighting the children who've lost their lives, and appealing to lawmakers for additional weapons. And the Pentagon says that's already in the works. Monkeypox cases are rising around the world with thousands of cases reported in the U.S., but many don't know how it's spread and which symptoms to look out for. One man is hoping that his story can help others take it more seriously. I knew monkeypox was this thing out there in the ether that potentially was something to be worried about at some point, and then it became very real very quickly in my life. And the uptick in shark sightings on one popular beach Five attacks reported in recent weeks. More lifeguards are now being added and state troopers are on patrol as so many head to the beach to try to get some relief from all this heat. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin with the extreme heat blanketing the country tonight. More than 140 million Americans in 29 states are under heat alerts from California to Kansas to New England. And some places now face the prospect of the longest heat waves in years. Philadelphia has declared a heat emergency. Temperatures could hit 100 degrees for the first time in a decade there this weekend. The last time New York City saw a stretch of seven days with at least 90 degree weather was nine years ago. And as the weather gets hotter here, there's no relief for millions in the heartland. Extreme heat is fueling grass fires like this one in Oklahoma. The thermometer could hit 110 degrees in the coming days in Oklahoma City, Dallas, and Tulsa. Today, President Biden faced renewed pressure to declare a national climate emergency as he announced several climate-related executive actions. This comes as average temperatures continue to rise as the effects of human-induced climate change take hold. Rob Marciano is standing by with more on that and if any relief from this latest round of heat is in sight. But first, Whit Johnson leads us off from New York. Tonight, that dangerous heat and humidity now taking aim at the East Coast. So hot in Philadelphia, officials shoring up emergency resources to protect public health. The city of Philadelphia just declaring a heat emergency, which will go into effect tomorrow. New York City potentially facing the longest heat wave in nine years. Workers sweltering under the blazing sun. As we go through the evening hours, check this out. Even at 10, 11 o'clock, still feels like 90 degrees with the heat and humidity. The heat also fueling storms in the south. At Fort Gordon in Georgia, 10 soldiers were injured after a lightning strike in a training area. And an American Airlines flight from Tampa to Nashville diverting to Birmingham after severe turbulence. Eight people were hurt. Doctors urging people to stay hydrated and avoid prolonged exposure outside. Phelps Hospital in Westchester County, New York, seeing a 30 to 40 percent uptick in heat-related visits to the ER. We see both heat-related emergencies, but then also significant heat can exacerbate really anything. So patients are more likely to have heart attacks. They're more likely to have strokes. In Red Bank, New Jersey, a hospital racing to relocate some patients after the air conditioning in the emergency room failed for a time. Officials say all are safe. Experts say climate change has made rare heat waves three to five degrees warmer in much of the U.S., and it's at least double the likelihood of record-breaking hot summer days. The heat alerts now stretching from coast to coast, with most of Texas still over 100 degrees, fueling multiple fires. And officials say so far the state's power grid is holding. But for millions in the plains, no sign of relief anytime soon.
So many eager to find that relief. Whit Johnson joins us now live from a Con Ed service station in the Bronx. And Whit, what's their message tonight to residents about this heat wave? Well, Lindsay, Con Edison is actually sending out text message alerts urging people to limit their energy use to help prevent possible outages. They also say they're uh, beefing up their resources to be able to respond to any potential problems with this heat wave expected to last possibly in the next week. Lindsay? Fingers crossed they can hold up. Wit, our thanks to you. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking this all for us. So, Rob, how long can we expect this extreme heat to last? Well, for quite a while, Lindsay, at least uh, here in the Northeast, this may be the longest stretch of 90 plus degree weather that we've seen in, in nearly a decade and across the Southern Plains. It's been like this for a month. Let's take a look at the maps again. The Southern Plains through the heartland, uh, they're under excessive heat warnings. Louisville, Southern Indiana through Memphis, back through Dallas. Dallas, you had a record high again today. Same with Austin, up and over 100 degrees. And Oklahoma as a state, uh, you haven't seen this sort of heat ever uh, as, as far as the expansive nature of it. Across the corners we still have the heat baking the southwest there less humidity of course and in the northeast and the east coast advisories are now up so that's where it's expanding and the i-95 corridor although we have been hot here over the next last couple of days it's only going to keep going this way through the weekend mid to upper 90s Hartford, Rhode Island, in through Boston, back through Philadelphia, near 100 degrees. There is a cool front coming through, but obviously it can't be that strong. It's strong enough to spawn some severe weather. We had a watch up in Ohio uh, earlier today, and tomorrow, Birmingham, Atlanta, through Charlotte and Raleigh, we'll see some strong winds and uh, flash flooding across parts of northern New England. Also, we'll see similar storms, but again, these won't uh, cool things off. We expect the extended stretch of hot weather to continue into next week. All amplified, by the way, Lindsay, by climate change. Right. And Rob, I was just going to ask you about that because we keep hearing that scientists are saying that we should essentially expect, I guess, these temperatures to continue to rise. Well, yeah, we just kind of load the dice. You know, we make it more accessible for the atmosphere to produce these heat waves. And especially if you get an unusual weather pattern where things can get stuck, sometimes you'll see a cycle that feeds on itself. I want to show you a, a set of maps here that kind of shows you how the averages have increased over the past decades. When you when you look at the average temperature across the U.S. In, 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 the, in the 20th century, and then you compare it from uh, 1961 to 1990, uh, the, the map looks relatively sublime. <clears throat> but then you go uh, for the next 10 years and you see the averages start to inch up. And then 1981 and then 91 to basically the present, we are just red hot with temperatures off the charts uh, exceeding 1, 2 degrees uh, Fahrenheit and Celsius in some cases. So the trend is not a good one, uh, Lindsay, and it doesn't look like it's going to be reversing anytime soon, certainly as we keep pumping out greenhouse gases. Yeah, more Lindsay. and more of that dark red uh, creeping up its way across the map. Rob Marciano, our thanks to you as always. You got it. Now to the pressure President Biden is facing to declare a national climate emergency. The president is in Massachusetts today to announce several executive actions to tackle climate change after Senator Joe Manchin foiled his hopes for legislation on the matter. Take a listen to some of what he had to say. So let me be clear. Climate change is an emergency. As president, I have a responsibility to act with urgency and resolve when our nation faces clear and present danger. And that's what climate change is about. It is literally, not figuratively, a clear and present danger. The health of our citizens and our communities is literally at stake. Terry Moran joins us now from Washington. Terry, we just heard the president say climate change is an emergency, a clear and present danger, but then he doesn't officially declare it an emergency. Certainly seems like he's under a lot of pressure to do so. He sure is, Lindsay, and he's under pressure. And as he said when he got back to Washington, he's, quote, running the traps on what kind of authorities are in that declaration of national emergency that would allow him to address this, this climate challenge. He did take some smaller unilateral steps today, $2.3 billion to make infrastructure more resilient uh, in those communities that have been hardest hit by climate change. He's directed federal agencies to help lower income Americans with their air conditioning and cooling expenses. And he's also directed the Interior Department to open up some areas of the Gulf of Mexico for offshore wind power. All that, however, very small measures in the face of the scale of this challenge. Many consider it a drop in a bucket. Terry Moran, our thanks to you.
The primetime hearing of the January 6th committee is set for tomorrow. Americans will hear testimony from former White House counsel Pat Cipollone, including what he warned the former president about as the attack on the Capitol unfolded. Here's ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. The January 6th committee is preparing a dramatic primetime presentation, a detailed accounting of what Donald Trump was doing for more than three hours while the U.S. Capitol was under attack by his supporters. This is all about the president's dereliction of duty and uh, the 187 minutes that he was in the White House uh, while this beautiful building and the temple of democracy behind me uh, was uh, under attack. The key witness will be White House counsel Pat Cipollone, who was with the president in the West Wing on January 6th and who spent some eight hours answering questions in a videotaped deposition. ABC News has learned that the committee asked Cipollone about conversations within the cabinet about invoking the 25th Amendment, which enables the cabinet to declare a president mentally unfit for office. As I reported in the book Betrayal, as the riot unfolded, Cipollone pleaded with Trump to condemn it, warning him that if he didn't, he risked being removed from office either through impeachment or the 25th Amendment. Cipollone testified he repeatedly urged Trump to make a public statement calling on his supporters to leave the Capitol. I felt it was my obligation to continue to push for that, and others felt it was their obligation as well. Would it have been possible at any moment for the president to walk down to the podium in the briefing room and, and tell, talk to the nation? Would it have been possible? Yes. Yes, it would have been possible. But not an option the former president chose to take at that time. Jonathan Carl joins us now. John, it took months for the committee to get Pat Cipollone to testify. And you've learned that they asked him about discussions on whether or not to invoke the 25th Amendment to remove President Trump from office. What have you learned about those conversations? Well, I, we know those conversations were happening at a very high level with the, within the cabinet and that Cipollone uh, had, had warned Trump that if he didn't get out there and do something to stop the riot, that he was at very high risk of being removed from office, either through that path, the 25th Amendment, or through impeachment. And look, Lindsay, Cipollone is the key witness for this part of the, uh, of the hearings because he was there with Donald Trump when all of this went down. And I I know I've been told by uh, a source close to Cipollone that he came very close to resigning on January 6th, ultimately decided not to do so because he believed that things would have gotten even worse if he had left. He felt that he was one person there who could stop, at least stop the president uh, from, from, from doing things uh, that would have made the situation even worse. All right, Jonathan Carl reporting from the nation's capital. Our thanks to you, John, as always. ABC News Live coverage of the hearing begins tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, right after Prime. Last night, the U.S. House passed a bill codifying the right to same-sex and interracial marriage in the wake of the Supreme Court's reversal of Roe v. Wade, responding to concerns that marriage rights could be threatened in the future. For more on that vote, we are joined now by Jim Obergefell, the lead plaintiff in the Supreme Court's case that made same-sex marriage legal and who's now running for the Ohio State House. We thank you so much for joining us tonight. like to just d jump right in here. The final vote last night was 267 to 157 with 47 Republicans joining every Democrat in the majority. Just like to get your reaction to that vote if you were surprised by the bipartisan support. No, I, I'm not surprised. And in fact, we shouldn't be surprised because our marriages matter. And for the Republican Party who claims to be the pro-family party, voting to protect and respect marriage should be a no-brainer. I would expect all Republicans who claim to be pro-family to support this bill. And I think it's outrageous that other than those 47 people who did, the remainder of the Republican Party in the House chose to say they do not support families. They do not believe families deserve to be protected. I'm curious, now it goes on to the Senate. Do you feel confident that there will be enough Republican votes there in order to protect the right to, to marry on, on the national level? Well, you know, I certainly do wonder about that, given the the Senate GOP. Mitch McConnell has said that he is not going to push this. He is going to wait and see. Well, Senator McConnell, our families cannot wait and see. Our families deserve to be protected and respected. And for the GOP, as well as members of the highest court in the land, to say that 
we should go back to the founding of our nation, the late 18th century, in order to determine what our rights should be, I find that to be an appalling stance for any person to take to say that our rights, our values, and what our country stands for should be frozen in time as of 1789 when the Constitution was ratified. And we've heard from some Republicans who say that this bill isn't necessary and that this is a, quote, manufactured crisis, that marriage isn't threatened because of the Roe decision. But as you well know, Justice Clarence Thomas specifically mentioned that the decision in your case should be revisited in his opinion on Roe. So what's your response to the Senate Republicans who, who may argue that this bill isn't even needed right now? Well, my response is if it isn't even needed, then it shouldn't be hard for you to vote in favor of it. Take the time to say yay and show that you are actually pro-family, that you support keeping our relationships and our families safe and protected, and that we do deserve the respect that we get as married couples and as families. So no, it is not a manufactured crisis. We have a sitting Supreme Court justice who has made it clear he does not believe marriage equality should stand, and he has given a clarion call to opponents of marriage equality across the nation to come after marriage. So no, I don't feel safe, and no other person in this country should feel safe. And when we lose one right, all other rights are at risk. A big picture for us, do you think that views on same-sex marriage have evolved enough since the Supreme Court's decision that they won't be threatened, even if it were to come up uh, before the court again? Well, I don't think anything is a given. You know, 71% of Americans support marriage equality. So I will also say to the members of the Senate, GOP, your constituents support marriage equality. So do what your constituents believe in, what your constituents are in favor of, and support marriage equality. And we have senators like Senator Cruz saying that this should be overturned because it should be left up to the states. Well, Senator Cruz, Will you say that same thing about interracial marriage? Justice Thomas, will you say that same thing about interracial marriage? Interesting questions there. And you're also running for an Ohio House seat this year with your Democratic primary coming up in just a few weeks. The seat is in a part of Ohio where Republicans have long dominated. How do you view your chances if you're on the ballot in November? And, and why was it so important for you to run? My chances are great because people see in me someone who believes in doing the right thing, someone who is willing to fight no matter how overwhelming the odds might appear. Being part of marriage equality changed me profoundly, and I have to keep fighting for everyone, not just the few. And too many of our elected officials, they are doing things that harm the public. They are not doing public service. And that's why I'm running, because that has to change. Jim O. Burgerful, we thank you so much for your time tonight. Appreciate your insight. Thank you very much. Staying in Washington, where today, for the first time, the wife of a foreign leader addressed Congress. Ukraine's First Lady Olena Zelenska spoke out today to thank the U.S. for its support while making an emotional plea for more help in the fight against Russia. ABC's Rachel Scott reports in from Capitol Hill. Tonight, an unprecedented and personal plea from the First Lady of Ukraine, Olena Zelenska, warning of a worsening humanitarian crisis. I want to address you not as First Lady, but as a daughter and as a mother. One by one, Zelenska showing images of the youngest victims of the war. Four-year-old Lisa, who she met in December, killed by a Russian missile. Her stroller toppled over in the street. Lisa's mother is in serious condition and for several days nobody dared to tell her that Lisa has died. Five-year-old Eva, who liked to draw pictures, killed alongside her grandmother. And Sofia from Bucha, who lost her mother and her arm in the violence. How many families like this may still be destroyed by the war? She pleaded for more weapons and specifically air defense systems from the U.S. and what she described as a common cause. We are grateful, really grateful, that the United States stands with us in this fight for our shared values of human life and independence. Her speech ending with a rousing standing ovation. The U.S. is promising to deliver four more HIMAR rocket systems to Ukraine, in addition to the dozen the U.S. has already sent. 
Ukrainian officials credit the systems with helping blunt the Russian offensive in eastern Ukraine. But the White House also warning Moscow plans to annex more territory in Ukraine beyond what it already controls. That desperate plea from the First Lady of Ukraine. Rachel Scott joins us now from the Capitol. Rachel, we heard new warnings from both U.S. intelligence as well as Russian officials on Russia's plans. What's each side saying? Well, tonight, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has a very stark warning, saying that if Western countries continue to supply Ukraine with long-range weapons, then it will, in fact, expand further into the country. But U.S. officials from the State Department say they knew that this was Russia's plan all along, and they are not surprised by this, Lindsay. All right. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you as always. Like much of the country here in New York, the heat is on and people are flocking to the beach for some semblance of relief. But shark sightings are up, forcing some Long Island beaches to close for now a second day in a row. Our Ariel Reshef is at Rockaway Beach. Tonight, swimmers urged to be on high alert at the most popular beaches in the New York City area. There was a fish that jumped out of the water today and everyone kind of had a little look to the side. I think it was a shark. Park officials shutting down some areas to swimmers for a second day in a row after shark sightings on Long Beach. On Tuesday, similar sightings at other beaches too. It was five to six feet, 25 yards out, um, and it definitely had the triangular fin. We both saw it and we took the proper precautions, let the lieutenant know, red flag the beach. And New York's Long Island reporting five shark attacks in the last few weeks. Late today, officials saying what appears to be the carcass of a great white shark washed ashore there. New York's Governor Kathy Hochul increasing the number of lifeguards and state troopers patrolling for sharks. Our beaches are such an important part of our uh, attraction. You know, why people love living here, why they want to visit here, and we need to keep our beaches safe. With beaches now reopening, surfers cautiously heading back into the water. It's always something to look out for, especially now. It's a worry. Lots of concern for sure. Thanks to Ariel for that. When we come back, the dramatic video on the woman pleading, I don't want to die as an officer tries to save her life. Writing a wrong, the black family given back the deed to parts of a Southern California beach decades after it was taken from their ancestors. But up next, monkeypox cases continue to rise. Just how concerned should we be? Our in-depth look next. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. 
Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. A South Carolina officer is being hailed a hero after he saved a woman as he was driving home from work around 1.30 in the morning. He stopped after coming across a crash and seeing this fiery car several weeks ago. He got out of his vehicle, fire extinguisher in hand, and found a woman pleading to be rescued. Officer Doug Richards of the Mount Pleasant Police Force put out the flames and was safely able to rescue the woman. It is the latest virus spreading across the United States, and the exploding case count has doctors expressing serious concerns. So what is monkeypox? How does it spread? What are the signs and symptoms? And how can you stay protected? ABC's Andrew Dimbert reports. Overall, really miserable, swollen left nodes, not good. I've got these on my arms and hands that you can see. They are uh, really not cute. For Matt Ford, it was first the spots that raised the alarm, then came the symptoms, many of them similar to the flu. Fever, sore throat, cough, um, uh, full body chills, sweating through my sheets at night, and uh, I went and got tested. The diagnosis, monkeypox, a virus rarely detected outside of Africa, and it's now making its way through the United States. This experience was uh, one of the most painful things I've ever gone through in my life. More lesions appeared as the flu-like symptoms kind of went away. I think in total I counted more than 25 all over my body. Some were really excruciating on more sensitive skin. Others, at best, were really itchy and annoying. Um, I had to go back to my doctor again to get pain medicine just to be able to go to sleep some nights. Matt's illness lasted for three weeks. So the reason I'm speaking out about it is because I tweeted about it and it kind of started to blow up. So he decided to make his story public in hopes of raising awareness about a virus that's spreading at a substantial speed. I guess I wanted people to take it seriously because I was one of those people who didn't take it that seriously before it directly affected me. I knew monkeypox was this thing out there in the ether that potentially was something to be worried about at some point. And then it became very real very quickly in my life. More than 2,300 cases have been reported in the country, and it's been just 63 days after the first known case. And New York, like with COVID, has become the epicenter of the virus in the U.S. And that's probably an undercount. So it's something we need to take seriously, not to panic by it, because we do have a lot of understanding of it. So we're not in the dark about this, although we really must take it seriously because it is, in fact, spreading at a rate that we feel we must address. This is not a new virus. The first human case of monkeypox was recorded in 1970, a rare disease with an unknown origin. According to the World Health Organization, the current monkeypox spread probably began at big parties in Spain and Belgium. In the U.S., nobody has died of monkeypox, but the symptoms can be painful and typically start within three weeks of exposure. The telltale signs, fever, headache, muscle aches, swollen lymph nodes, chills, exhaustion, and a very painful rash unique to monkeypox. It is an infection that is spread by close physical contact, skin to skin contact. Apart from spreading through skin to skin contact or touching the rash, monkeypox can be passed through prolonged face to face contact, such as kissing or by touching items that were used or came in contact with the infectious rash. There is treatment and a vaccine available, but these days getting an appointment is not an easy task. In New York City, a batch of 8,200 appointments released on Friday night were booked up in just minutes amid a nationwide vaccine shortage. There are not enough vaccines to keep up with the demand, says the CDC. In New York City, long lines and people trying their luck. I came here for like three days already because I don't have an appointment. I went to the website and they the website crash. I concern about the monkey fox virus because I'm working in the field, like uh, nightlife. You know, when we're working, people kissing you, people holding you, you know. 
The Department of Human and Health Services announcing more than 300,000 vaccines have been made available since May, and a shipping of another 700,000 is in the works, plus 2 million and a half doses should become available in 2023. But for now, vaccination is limited to the populations most at risk, including anyone who has been exposed and men that are sexually active with other men. If you look at the numbers, the overwhelming proportion of people who have been infected are men who have sex with men. But it is not exclusive to that demographic. But there's no place at all for any stigmatization when you're dealing with a public health issue. Yes, it is high within the queer community right now, but it is not targeting queerness. In the LGBTQI community, monkeypox feeling like a throwback to the discrimination gay men faced when HIV first came around. I got some really cruel DMs and comments, messages from people. There were a few comments that referenced that maybe this was like God's punishment in some way to like gay men, uh, which kind of echoes some sentiment that we saw during the HIV epidemic. The reality is that the virus does not discriminate and cases have already been reported outside of the LGBTQI community. Cases are growing quickly, especially now that the testing capacity has been expanded to 70,000 tests per week, and an uptick is expected during the rest of July and August. And there's no clarity yet about when the vaccine will be widely available. For high-risk groups, prevention for now seems to be the key. What I am telling people is just being really mindful of who you're in close proximity with, especially people in the demographics like the queer community who are most at risk. Get vaccinated as soon as possible if you can. Obviously, there's a short supply, but more are on the way. So as soon as you can, even if it's just the first shot, get it ASAP. Our thanks to Andrew for that. Still ahead here on Prime, the police in San Bernardino tell their side of the story after video of a deadly police-involved shooting leaked. But the family of the man shot and killed is also demanding. A major update in a case that horrified America. The younger Turpin children are now suing a California county that they live in and a foster agency. How they say they were failed by the system. And the U.S. Army has some serious recruiting challenges. We take a look by the numbers, but first our tweet of the day from Buzz Aldrin, 53 years after he achieved one of the most important feats in the history of mankind. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Okay, we made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated abcnews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation 
abcnews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back, everyone. It seems that fewer Americans want to be all they can be as the U.S. Army faces a recruiting shortfall. Let's take a look by the numbers. The U.S. Army says that it will fall short of its goal for 60,000 new service members by the end of the fiscal year. That's according to congressional testimony from one of the Army's top leaders. The Army has met 50 percent of that goal to date and projects that it will fall about 10,000 soldiers short of the goal by the end of September. That means the U.S. Army's total force will be about 466,400 by the end of the fiscal year instead of the target of 476,000. And that recruiting target had already been lowered earlier this year after the Army saw lower numbers of incoming recruits. The Army says that it could also fall short by as many as 28,000 soldiers on the next fiscal year's recruitment goal. That would mean a two-year shortfall of close to 40,000 service members. So what's driving the decline? The Army points to the post-COVID economy with unemployment less than 4% and private companies offering more pay and incentive to new employees. And the pool of eligible Americans has shrunk from 29% to 23% as fewer young Americans meet the Army's physical standards to serve. That's according to Army officials. Now that's left in the Army considering more financial incentives to try to boost the ranks of new recruits. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. Before he killed 12 people at a movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, James Holmes spent months being treated by a psychiatrist. Ten years later, she tells us her side of the story. We're hearing from the parents of two black girls at the center of that viral video at Sesame Place, what they now want the park to do to the performer who they say ignored the little pair. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. So much at stake in our world right now. We wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Thank you.
As more than 100 million Americans face heat advisories across the country, President Biden taking new executive actions to address the scorching temperatures and climate change. It is literally not figuratively a clear and present danger. The actions will provide $2.3 billion for stronger infrastructure meant to withstand the effects of climate change and funding to help low-income families improve air conditioning in their homes. Unbearable heat coast to coast, wildfires raging in Texas and now the Northeast facing high temperatures, some areas hitting the triple digits. Experts say climate change has accelerated the frequency, number and intensity of heat waves, also making them three to five degrees warmer in much of the U.S. Biden considering declaring a national climate emergency. Police in California dealing with the aftermath of a deadly police shooting and questions of whether the shooting was justified. San Bernardino police releasing detailed video of the July 16th incident, including surveillance images and body camera footage. Police said Rob Marquise Adams pulled a gun out as he approached two officers and failed to listen to their commands. As he was running away, an officer shot Adams, who later died. Adams' family believes he was not holding a gun, but a cell phone. At a press conference with Adams' family, attorney Ben Crump criticized the officer's actions. This is a classic example of shoot first and ask questions later. Why is it the police think the most dangerous thing in America is a black man running away from them? In South Carolina, disbarred attorney Alex Murdoch pleaded not guilty to murdering his wife and son at a hearing today. The once prominent attorney was making his first court appearance since being indicted on the murder charges last week. His defense attorneys requested a speedy trial and pushed authorities to go after the real killers. Murdoch had already been jailed on insurance fraud charges, accused of trying to stage his own murder, and will remain behind bars ahead of the trial for the June 2021 killings. Funeral services held today in Manhattan for Ivana Trump. The ex-wife of former President Trump died last week at the age of 73. The former president was in attendance along with former First Lady Melania Trump, as well as his three children with Ivana and their families. Ivana Trump was found unresponsive at the bottom of a staircase in her apartment on the Upper East Side. The New York Medical Examiner's Office says her death was accidental, caused by injuries from a fall. Apology not accepted so far from the family and attorneys of two young black girls who appear to have been snubbed by a Sesame Place character at Sesame Place. We reject any notion that the performer's actions this past Saturday was anything short of intentional. I just want them to be able to do the right thing, being that me, my niece, and my daughter has, have all suffered um, one embarrassment. Yes. Um, discriminatory behavior. Sesame Place promising to take action, including better training of employees. The six-year-old girls were seen on video, arms outstretched for the character Rosita, but apparently being waved away, the family says, in favor of other white children. A wrong finally righted after nearly 100 years. A parcel of Manhattan Beach in California that was taken from the Bruce family by eminent domain, officially handed back to the family. The land known as Bruce's Beach had been owned by Charles and Willa Bruce, who ran a resort on the property, which catered to African Americans until the land was taken by the city in 1924. Now, descendants of the Bruce's were on hand to accept the deed to the property, completing a long process to return the land to its rightful owners. New developments in the case of the Turpin children, the 13 siblings rescued after being held captive by their parents. Lawyers for some of the kids filed a lawsuit saying that the children were failed by the people who were supposed to care for them. ABC's Steve Osinsami spoke with the lawyers and has the details. This is 911, do you have an emergency? Um, I just ran away from home. This was the call for help that set them free, the 13 children in California who had to be rescued by police. Nearly all of them were tortured and kept as prisoners by their own parents, who are now sitting in prison, serving 25 years to life. Uh, I just went away from home because I was in a family of 15, okay? Can you hear me? And we have abusing parents. Did you hear that? More than four years later, some of these same children are now suing their county and a private foster care agency who they say failed to protect them after law enforcement officers removed them from the nightmare that was their home. 
In a new lawsuit, attorneys for the six youngest children of the Turpin family say that the foster family, who was paid to raise them after they were rescued, was also abusive. It's, it's not only shocking, it should make everyone angry, because these children, were, you know, who were chained to their beds for a, a great majority of their life, finally are freed, right? And then the county places them with child net and puts them in another position where they are further abused. ChildNet is a private foster care agency contracted by Riverside County, east of Los Angeles. And in their lawsuit, the children say that the agency placed them in a home where they say the company knew that other foster care children who had spent time in that home had been abused. They accused the former foster parents and their daughter of hitting them in the face with sandals, pulling their hair, hitting them with a belt, and striking their heads. Some of them accused their former foster father of sexual abuse. And they say both foster parents would tell them that they were worthless and would encourage them to harm themselves. And while the kids were being abused further, the county closed their eyes. I mean, this, this case is one where the entire world was watching. And yet, even in that situation, uh, the county and ChildNet dropped the ball, which tells you I think pretty clearly what must be happening and what we've seen happen in other cases with kids who aren't famous, who are, whose cases are not high profile, who nobody knows about. It was a case of abuse and neglect in America in 2018 that broke hearts around the world. They pull our hair, they, they yank out our hair. I have two, my two little sisters right now are chained up. Okay, how old are you? I'm 17. What's your name? Jordan Turpin. In an emotional interview last November, Jordan Turpin first shared this story with ABC News anchor Diane Sawyer. I don't know how you had the courage, never having spoken to anyone like that. I think it was like us coming so close to death so many times, and like I was worried about my siblings, and when I saw them, them crying and worried. I just felt like I had to do it. Like, like I, I would just wanted to do it. I wanted to help everyone. According to the attorneys, the abuse in the foster home went on for three years until one of the children was old enough to leave and then told this story to a social worker. The three former foster family members are now facing more than a dozen criminal charges, including child abuse, neglect, and sexual assault. They've pled not guilty. A county spokeswoman tells us they've not seen the lawsuit, so they have no comment. We've reached out to ChildNet and did not get a response. But last year, a spokesperson for the foster care agency told ABC News that they could not comment specifically on the Turpin case because of confidentiality laws, but said, we take our work very seriously, including the extensive vetting of parents. The children are suing for damages, but their lawsuit at this point doesn't say for how much. I can't even tell you how many times our clients have told us, we just don't want this to happen to someone else. Steve Osinsami joins us now. Steve, there's a recent independent investigation into the Turpin case. What have we learned from that? Well, this independent investigation, the results are just in. They were presented to the community and it found that both the county and this private foster care agency failed to protect these children. People in this community were furious about this. Tonight, there are four children who are still in foster care. Their attorneys tell us that they are safe and together. And the attorneys also want to underline, Lindsay, that the children are filing this lawsuit because they want to save other kids. Mm -hmm. Lindsay. Trying to make sure it doesn't happen again. We can understand certainly why. Steve Osinsami, our thanks to you as always. Ten years ago, on July 20th, 2012, 12 people lost their lives and dozens more were injured at a midnight showing of Batman The Dark Knight Rises when James Holmes opened fire in an Aurora, Colorado movie theater. Holmes was ultimately sentenced to 12 life sentences plus an extra 3,000 years in prison for the mass murder. Before the massacre, psychiatrist Dr. Lynn Fenton spent months providing mental health care to Holmes. And after she spent years questioning whether she could have done something to stop the Aurora theater shooting,
anything from happening at all. Joining us now is Dr. Lynn Fenton, who co-wrote the new book, Aurora, the psychiatrist who treated the movie theater killer, tells her story about why she felt it was so, so important to share her story for the first time. Uh, Dr. Fenton, we, we thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, Holmes was a graduate student at the University of Colorado when he contacted the campus mental health center for help with his obsessive thoughts of killing people and his anxiety and social situations. You took his case and, and were the last mental health professional to see him before his rampage. Describe what he was like in those, those meetings that you had with him leading up to the shooting. Well, he was extremely anxious. Um, he and very awkward, sort of beyond just a smart and nerdy guy, but um, moved kind of awkwardly, almost robotically sometimes. And in talking to him, it was very hard to get him to say anything more than just a couple words or a brief sentence. And what might he say when he did say a couple of words? Well, he, he came in of his own accord, but it was actually at the behest of some of his supervisors in the neuroscience PhD program because he was so nervous and awkward in his lab presentations. But the thoughts of killing people, he just sort of added in almost incidentally, oh, I have thoughts of killing people, which is such a vague statement. And so I spent a lot of the six visits over several months trying to understand what was behind that. Was he going to do something? Were there, or were they just unbidden thoughts that he didn't like? But once somebody does tell a psychiatrist, you know, I have thoughts of, of killing people, and obviously you have the, the confidentiality, so at what point are you able to kind of raise this red flag that you have this client who desires to kill? Holmes never did this, but but if a person said, I, I have this target, there's a person I want to kill, or maybe a group of people, or I'd like to shoot up a theater, anything along those lines that, that's more specific than the vague statements that he had, then um, you can inform the police and have them look into that. And you can even put them on something called a mental health hold, which is where you can detain someone for up to three days to gather more information of what's going on. So shortly before the shooting, Holmes mailed you a notebook inside the notebook, which was titled Of Life, were Holmes' insights into my mind of madness, as he described it, that contained detailed plans of his desire to kill. The notebook arrived in your mailbox days after the shooting. What would you have done had you received the notebook earlier? Oh my gosh, if I had seen that, of course, I would have instantly called law enforcement. Um, but I, I think he did it on purpose. Like a lot of folks who do events like this will um, have a manifesto of types that they send off just a little before the shooting. Um, and essentially that's what this was. And it was an attempt to explain, you know, why he did this, but it Truly, it makes no sense to a sane person, but it, it really goes through the details of why he picked the theaters and how he cased the joint and, you know, when he was going to arrive. And it's, it's very chilling. And especially see there all those pages of why, why, why. It, what are uh -huh. your thoughts about why uh, we're seeing this rise in mass shootings 10 years still after that theater massacre? Why? You know, it's really hard to say. I think some of that is perhaps some really um, twisted online culture. Um, we know that young folks are struggling more than ever with mental health, so that may be a factor. And, you know, no doubt it, the easy access to lethal means. Right, and you are right, because it does seem like we're seeing a lot of, of 18, 19, 20, 21-year-olds uh, pulling the, the trigger in these mass shootings. You write about being vilified by the press and media, having your life threatened and being subjected to an internal review by your university. I want to just quote something that you wrote here. You said, I felt shattered, angry, betrayed. My life had become unrecognizable. With that, I, I'm curious to know how cathartic then it was for, for you to write about your experiences. Well, one of the things that made it really tough, especially 
during the period between the shooting and Holmes' trial was that we had um, a gag order, which um, affected not only me, but any person that had anything to do with the trial. So I could not defend myself. So uh, one part that, um, for me anyway, is great and hopefully helpful for the public to, to learn about the details is, is to finally be able to say, you know, the lengths that I went to to try to um, prevent anything like this. Dr. Lynn Fenton, we thank you so much for joining us and sharing your story. Aurora, the psychiatrist who treated the movie theater killer, tells her story. Is available now wherever books are sold. Novak Djokovic is on the entry list for the U.S. Open, but he will not be on the tennis court. Djokovic is, in, Djokovic is ineligible to compete because he has not received a COVID vaccination. The U.S. Tennis Association says that the U.S. Open does not have a vaccination requirement for players, but the U.S. requires non-citizens to be fully vaccinated against COVID in order to enter the country. Djokovic was also forced to skip the Australian Open earlier this year because of his vaccination status. A mother-daughter team is turning their love for food into a real bread and butter enterprise with their piping hot takes on food. Here's ABC's Will Gans with more on this hungry duo. <laughs> They're the unlikely food critics who have gotten a taste of TikTok fame and some other stuff. Cheers. Mm. Okay, we're buying we're going back. Meg Antonelli, a.k.a. Costco Mama, and her daughter Maddie started posting their food reviews back in 2020. It's an A-plus. I would definitely I recommend. recommend this. We were in Costco one day, and I'm like, let's review this hummus. I'm like, why not? Might as well try it out. So, and I thought she was crazy. Yeah, I was and like, <laughs> review? What I was mean? like, we're reviewing it on your TikTok account, because she had gotten like 200 uh, views at one point, and I, we thought that was so many. Now, more than 21 million likes and 618,000 followers later, I mean, we're we're honest with our reviewers. If we don't like something, you know we don't like it. Have you ever, like, tried something that you look back on and you're like, never again? Yes. The octopus. You know, no, I'm just saying that the octopus. <laughs> never again. <laughs> Might as well eat a can of cat food. I'm sorry. Maddie just graduated college in May. We have fun. Yeah, we have so much fun doing it together. Now that she's back home, Maddie and mom are able to up their review game. Where do the ideas come from? Going to Costco. <laughs> Going to Costco five times a week. Despite being Costco super fans, the Antonelli say they are not sponsored by the store. I think it's really that like mother daughter like duo that people like to see because yeah. I mean I've had people come up to me being like I don't have my mom in my life and like watching you guys it make it's like makes me feel so much better. Meg and Maddie just happy to serve up some smiles sometimes at their own expense. It has like almost it's got extra bubbles or something that it's like it's like an <laughs> ah. <laughs> it's like in my throat. Lots of fun with mom and daughter there. Our thanks to Will for that. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. The Ukrainian First Lady Elena Zelenska delivering her remarks in person to members of Congress. She spoke about the victims of the war and, of course, asked America to continue supporting their military operations. That's our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Up in the next hour, we're staying on top of a few things. Dangerous heat is causing an uptick in hospital visits and fueling wildfires. The warnings from doctors for people and their pets. The extreme heat is leading to scenes like this for people working in the elements. A UPS driver appears to collapse on the job. Why their work trucks don't have air conditioning? Coming up. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched most trusted and streaming live to you anytime anywhere and free 
This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download Load it now. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. So what's good to read this summer? Well, Kate and I have decided to jump in and help you. And we're talking with Oprah, John Irving, and so many popular authors and influencers. So we want you to join us. Myself, Charlie Gibson, and my daughter, Kate Gibson. Oh, hey, that's me. That is you. For the new podcast series, it is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen anywhere and anytime. The Bookcase Podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Charlotte Hornets forward Miles Bridges pleaded not guilty today on domestic violence and child abuse charges. Prosecutors say he assaulted his girlfriend in front of their two children. Bridges was the team's leading scorer last season. The Hornets and NBA say they are investigating. Leaders of Indiana's Republican-dominated Senate have proposed banning abortion with limited exception. It comes amid a political firestorm involving a 10 a rape victim who came to the state from Ohio in order to end her pregnancy. The new Indiana proposal will allow exceptions to the ban, including cases of rape, incest, or to protect a woman's life. The Supreme Court ruling overturning Roe v. Wade is expected to lead to abortion bans in roughly half of the United States. The Uvalde, Texas School Board will meet in a special session Saturday to consider a recommendation to fire the district's police chief, Pete Arredondo, following widespread criticism of how he handled the Robb Elementary School shooting. A report released this week accused Arredondo of not assuming the role of commander on the scene or transferring that responsibility to another officer. Now to the extreme heat that's blanketing the country. More than 140 million Americans in 29 states are currently under heat alerts from California to Kansas to New England. And some places now face the prospect of the longest heat waves in years. Which Johnson reports. Tonight, that dangerous heat and humidity now taking aim at the East Coast. So hot in Philadelphia, officials shoring up emergency resources to protect public health. The city of Philadelphia just declaring a heat emergency, which will go into effect tomorrow. New York City potentially facing the longest heat wave in nine years. Workers sweltering under the blazing sun. As we go through the evening hours, check this out. Even at 10, 11 o'clock, still feels like 90 degrees with the heat and humidity. The heat also fueling storms in the south. At Fort Gordon in Georgia, one soldier was killed and nine others injured after a lightning strike in a training area. And an American Airlines flight from Tampa to Nashville diverting to Birmingham after severe turbulence. Eight people were hurt. Doctors urging people to stay hydrated and avoid prolonged exposure outside. Phelps Hospital in Westchester County, New York, seeing a 30 to 40 percent uptick in heat-related visits to the ER. We see both heat-related emergencies, but then also significant heat can exacerbate really anything. So patients are more likely to have heart attacks. They're more likely to have strokes. In Red Bank, New Jersey, a hospital racing to relocate some patients after the air conditioning in the emergency room failed for a time. Officials say all are safe. Experts say climate change has made rare heat waves three to five degrees warmer in much of the U.S., and it's at least doubled the likelihood of record-breaking hot summer days. The heat alerts now stretching from coast to coast, with most of Texas still over 100 degrees, fueling multiple fires. And officials say so far the state's power grid is holding. But for millions in the plains, no sign of relief anytime soon.
So many eager to find that relief. Whit Johnson joins us now live from a Con Ed service station in the Bronx. And Whit, what's their message tonight to residents about this heat wave? Well, Lindsay, Con Edison is actually sending out text message alerts urging people to limit their energy use to help prevent possible outages. They also say they're uh, beefing up their resources to be able to respond to any potential problems with this heat wave expected to last possibly in the next week. Lindsay? Fingers crossed they can hold up. Wit, our thanks to you. Now let's go to one place that is used to all of this heat, Phoenix. But tonight, that heat is certainly taking a toll. You may have seen this video appearing to show a UPS driver collapsing while delivering a package. Reporter Ashley Paredes joins us now from KNXV in Phoenix. This is certainly remarkable video, Ashley, but, but why aren't those trucks cool and, and are there solutions out there? Right, Lindsay. Well, the trucks don't have air conditioning because of the frequent stops that these drivers make, some making as many as 200 stops a day. That's a lot. And those trucks don't have doors in the front, which help provide a steady breeze, but it's the back of those trucks that are producing the heavy heat. And just to give you some perspective, so far this year, Phoenix has hit 110 degrees or higher 17 times already. So the back of those trucks is you can imagine are even hotter than that. In the summer, though, UPS does provide water and ice to all of its employees. They also provide regular heat, illness, and injury prevention training to operations managers and drivers as well. But just tough conditions out there. Yeah, you can imagine it's just steamy in that storage area. How's UPS responding tonight? Well, UPS telling us that that driver that you see uh, in the video, that he is doing fine and that drivers in general are trained to work outdoors and for the effects of hot weather. Now, the driver, again, who collapsed, reportedly contacted his manager right away and was immediately provided assistance. Uh, but UPS says they don't want employees to overdo themselves and continue working to the point that they risk their health. So the company says that they do have a cool solutions program which focuses on educating employees about hydration along with nutrition and proper sleep all of those elements helping when you're working in hot conditions they also say that they have morning meetings with drivers all year round reminding them of the forecast temperatures and encouraging them to be aware of their own health conditions and report to them when needed ashley paredes our thanks to you some helpful tips and advice there we appreciate it now to the primetime hearing of the January 6th committee set for tomorrow night where Americans will hear testimony from former White House counsel Pat Cipollone. ABC's chief Washington correspondent Jonathan Carl has the latest, including what Cipollone warned the president as the attack on the Capitol unfolded. The January 6th committee is preparing a dramatic primetime presentation, a detailed accounting of what Donald Trump was doing for more than three hours while the U.S. Capitol was under attack by his supporters. This is all about the president's dereliction of duty and uh, the 187 minutes that he was in the White House uh, while this beautiful building and the temple of democracy behind me uh, was uh, under attack. The key witness will be White House counsel Pat Cipollone, who was with the president in the West Wing on January 6th and who spent some eight hours answering questions in a videotape deposition. ABC News has learned that the committee asked Cipollone about conversations within the cabinet about invoking the 25th Amendment, which enables the cabinet to declare a president mentally unfit for office. As I reported in the book Betrayal, as the riot unfolded, Cipollone pleaded with Trump to condemn it, warning him that if he didn't, he risked being removed from office, either through impeachment or the 25th Amendment. Cipollone testified he repeatedly urged Trump to make a public statement calling on his supporters to leave the Capitol. I felt it was my obligation to continue to push for that, and others felt it was their obligation as well. Would it have been possible at any moment for the president to walk down to the podium in the briefing room and, and talk to the nation? Would it have been possible? Yes. Well, yes, it would have been possible. But not an option the former president chose to take at that time. Jonathan Carl joins us now. John, it took months for the committee to get Pat Cipollone to testify. And you have learned that they asked him about discussions on whether or not to invoke the 25th Amendment to remove President Trump from office. What have you learned about those conversations? 
Well, uh, we know those conversations were happening at a very high level with the, in, within the cabinet and that Cipollone uh, had, had warned Trump that if he didn't get out there and do something to stop the riot, that he was at very high risk of being removed from office, either through that path, the 25th Amendment, or through impeachment. And look, Lindsay, Cipollone is the key witness for this part of the, uh, of the hearings because he was there with Donald Trump when all of this went down. And I know I've been told by uh, a source close to Cipollone that he came very close to resigning on January 6th, ultimately decided not to do so because he believed that things would have gotten even worse if he had left. He felt that he was one person there who could stop, at least stop the president uh, from, from, from doing things uh, that would have made the situation even worse. All right, Jonathan Carl reporting from the nation's capital. Our thanks to you, John, as always. ABC News Live coverage of the hearing begins tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, right after Prime. Last night, the U.S. House passed a bill codifying the right to same-sex and interracial marriage in the wake of the Supreme Court's reversal of Roe v. Wade, responding to concerns that marriage rights could be threatened in the future. For more on that vote, we are joined now by Jim Obergefell, the lead plaintiff in the Supreme Court's case that made same-sex marriage legal and who's now running for the Ohio State House. We thank you so much for joining us tonight. like to just d jump right in here. The final vote last night was 260 to 157 with 47 Republicans joining every Democrat in the majority. Just like to get your reaction to that vote if you were surprised by the bipartisan support. No, I, I'm not surprised. And in fact, we shouldn't be surprised because our marriages matter. And for the Republican Party who claims to be the pro-family party, voting to protect and respect marriage should be a no-brainer. I would expect all Republicans who claim to be pro-family to support this bill. And I think it's outrageous that other than those 47 people who did, the remainder of the Republican Party in the House chose to say they do not support families. They do not believe families deserve to be protected. I'm curious, now it goes on to the Senate. Do you feel confident that there will be enough Republican votes there in order to protect the right to, to marry on, on the national level? Well, you know, I certainly do wonder about that, given the the Senate GOP. Mitch McConnell has said that he is not going to push this. He is going to wait and see. Well, Senator McConnell, our families cannot wait and see. Our families deserve to be protected and respected. And for the GOP, as well as members of the highest court in the land, to say that we should go back to the founding of our nation, the late 18th century in order to determine what our rights should be, I find that to be an appalling stance for any person to take to say that our rights, our values, and what our country stands for should be frozen in time as of 1789 when the Constitution was ratified. And we've heard from some Republicans who say that this bill isn't necessary and that this is a, quote, manufactured crisis, that marriage isn't threatened because of the Roe decision. But as you well know, Justice Clarence Thomas specifically mentioned that the decision in your case should be revisited in his opinion on Roe. So what's your response to the Senate Republicans who, who may argue that this bill isn't even needed right now? Well, my response is if it isn't even needed, then it shouldn't be hard for you to vote in favor of it. Take the time to say yay and show that you are actually pro-family, that you support keeping our relationships and our families safe and protected, and that we do deserve the respect that we get as married couples and as families. So no, it is not a manufactured crisis. We have a sitting Supreme Court justice who has made it clear he does not believe marriage equality should stand, and he has given a clarion call to opponents of marriage equality across the nation to come after marriage. So no, I don't feel safe, and no other person in this country should feel safe. And when we lose one right, all other rights are at risk. A big picture for us, do you think that views on same-sex marriage have evolved enough since the Supreme Court's decision that they won't be threatened, even if it were to come up uh, before the court again? Well, I don't think anything is a given. You know, 71% of Americans support marriage equality. So I will also say to the members of the Senate, GOP, your constituents support marriage equality. 
So do what your constituents believe in, what your constituents are in favor of, and support marriage equality. And we have senators like Senator Cruz saying that this should be overturned because it should be left up to the states. Well, Senator Cruz, will you say that same thing about interracial marriage? Justice Thomas, will you say that same thing about interracial marriage? Interesting questions there. And you're also running for an Ohio House seat this year with your Democratic primary coming up in just a few weeks. The seat is in a part of Ohio where Republicans have long dominated. How do you view your chances if you're on the ballot in November? And, and why was it so important for you to run? My chances are great because people see in me someone who believes in doing the right thing, someone who is willing to fight no matter how overwhelming the odds might appear. Being part of marriage equality changed me profoundly, and I have to keep fighting for everyone, not just the few. And too many of our elected officials, they are doing things that harm the public. They are not doing public service. And that's why I'm running, because that has to change. Jim O. Burgerful, we thank you so much for your time tonight. Appreciate your insight. Thank you very much. Today, for the first time, the wife of a foreign leader addressed Congress. Ukraine's First Lady Olena Zelenska speaking today to thank the U.S. for its support while making an emotional appeal for more help in the fight against Russia. ABC's Rachel Scott has the details from Capitol Hill. Tonight, an unprecedented and personal plea from the First Lady of Ukraine, Olena Zelenska, warning of a worsening humanitarian crisis. I want to address you not as First Lady, but as a daughter and as a mother. One by one, Zelenska showing images of the youngest victims of the war. Four-year-old Lisa, who she met in December, killed by a Russian missile. Her stroller toppled over in the street. Lisa's mother is in serious condition and for several days nobody dared to tell her that Lisa has died. Five-year-old Eva, who liked to draw pictures, killed alongside her grandmother. And Sofia from Bucha, who lost her mother and her arm in the violence. How many families like this may still be destroyed by the war? She pleaded for more weapons and specifically air defense systems from the U.S. and what she described as a common cause. We are grateful, really grateful, that the United States stands with us in this fight for our shared values of human life and independence. Her speech ending with a rousing standing ovation. The U.S. is promising to deliver four more HIMAR rocket systems to Ukraine in addition to the dozen the U.S. has already sent. Ukrainian officials credit the systems with helping blunt the Russian offensive in eastern Ukraine. But the White House also warning Moscow plans to annex more territory in Ukraine beyond what it already controls. Our thanks to Rachel Scott. Still to come, the oil spill in the tropics. Plus, exactly what is monkeypox and just how concerned should we be? Stay with us. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right.
Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Sri Lankan lawmakers have elected the country's prime minister as the new president. Supporters of protesters quickly gathered for demonstrations after the announcement was made. Earlier this month, you'll remember the former president fled and then resigned following weeks of protests demanding top leaders to step down amid a growing economic crisis. Some families in the UK have lost their homes after wildfires fueled by record heat. Several homes in this village east of London were destroyed by the flames. Aerial footage shows firefighters working to put out the remaining flames. Wednesday was London's hottest day ever, reaching nearly 104 degrees. A vessel delivering fuel spilled about 30,000 gallons en route to the Bahamas resort island of Great Exuma. The area is famed for its white sand beaches and crystal blue waters, as well as beaches where tourists can swim with pigs. Oil company executives say they're cooperating with efforts to clean up the spill. It's not clear yet what the environmental impact of the spill will be. It is the latest virus spreading across the country, and the exploding case count has doctors expressing some serious concerns. So what exactly is monkeypox? How does it spread? What are the signs and symptoms? And how can you stay protected? ABC's Andrew Dimpert reports. Overall, really miserable, swollen left nodes. Not good. I've got these on my arms and hands that you can see. They are uh, really not cute. For Matt Ford, it was first the spots that raised the alarm, then came the symptoms, many of them similar to the flu. Fever, sore throat, cough, um, uh, full body chills, sweating through my sheets at night, and uh, I went and got tested. The diagnosis? Monkeypox, a virus rarely detected outside of Africa, and it's now making its way through the United States. This experience was uh, one of the most painful things I've ever gone through in my life. More lesions appeared as the flu-like symptoms kind of went away. I think in total I counted more than 25 all over my body. Some were really excruciating on more sensitive skin. Others, at best, were really itchy and annoying. Um, I had to go back to my doctor again to get pain medicine just to be able to go to sleep some nights. Matt's illness lasted for three weeks. So the reason I'm speaking out about it is because I tweeted about it and it kind of started to blow up. So he decided to make his story public in hopes of raising awareness about a virus that's spreading at a substantial speed. I guess I wanted people to take it seriously because I was one of those people who didn't take it that seriously before it directly affected me. I knew monkeypox was this thing out there in the ether that potentially was something to be worried about at some point. And then it became very real very quickly in my life. More than 2,300 cases have been reported in the country, and it's been just 63 days after the first known case. And New York, like with COVID, has become the epicenter of the virus in the U.S. And that's probably an undercount. So it's something we need to take seriously, not to panic by it, because we do have a lot of understanding of it. So we're not in the dark about this, although we really must take it seriously because it is in fact spreading at a rate that we feel we must address. This is not a new virus. The first human case of monkeypox was recorded in 1970, a rare disease with an unknown origin. According to the World Health Organization, the current monkeypox spread probably began at big parties in Spain and Belgium. In the US, nobody has died of monkeypox, but the symptoms can be painful and typically start within three weeks of exposure. The telltale signs, fever, headache, muscle aches, swollen lymph nodes, chills, exhaustion, and a very painful rash unique to monkeypox. It is an infection that is spread by close physical contact, skin to skin contact. Apart from spreading through skin to skin contact or touching the rash, monkeypox can be passed through prolonged face to face contact, such as kissing or by touching items that were used or came in contact with the infectious rash. There is treatment and a vaccine available, but these days getting an appointment is not an easy task. In New York City, a batch of 8,200 appointments released on Friday night were booked up in just minutes amid a nationwide vaccine shortage. There are not enough vaccines to keep up with the demand, says the CDC. In New York City, long lines and people trying their luck. I came here for like three days already because I don't have an appointment. I went to the website and they 
the website crash. I concern about the monkey fox virus because I'm working in the field, like uh, nightlife. You know, when we're working, people kissing you, people hugging you, you know. The Department of Human and Health Services announcing more than 300,000 vaccines have been made available since May, and a shipping of another 700,000 is in the works, plus 2 million and a half doses should become available in 2023. But for now, vaccination is limited to the populations most at risk, including anyone who has been exposed and men that are sexually active with other men. If you look at the numbers, the overwhelming proportion of people who have been infected are men who have sex with men. But it is not exclusive to that demographic. But there's no place at all for any stigmatization when you're dealing with a public health issue. Yes, it is high within the queer community right now, but it is not targeting queerness. In the LGBTQI community, monkeypox feeling like a throwback to the discrimination gay men faced when HIV first came around. I got some really cruel DMs and comments, messages from people. There were a few comments that referenced that maybe this was like God's punishment in some way to like gay men, uh, which kind of echoes some sentiment that we saw during the HIV epidemic. The reality is that the virus does not discriminate and cases have already been reported outside of the LGBTQI community. Cases are growing quickly, especially now that the testing capacity has been expanded to 70,000 tests per week, and an uptick is expected during the rest of July and August. And there's no clarity yet about when the vaccine will be widely available. For high-risk groups, prevention for now seems to be the key. What I am telling people is just being really mindful of who you're in close proximity with, especially people in the demographics like the queer community who are most at risk. Get vaccinated as soon as possible if you can. Obviously, there's a short supply, but more are on the way. So as soon as you can, even if it's just the first shot, get it ASAP. Our thanks to Andrew for that. And still to come, the military instructor who is inspiring others. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. A military training instructor at Joint Base San Antonio Lackland not only serves our country by training the best to be the best, but is serving as a beacon of hope and inspiration to many. Reporter Jonathan Coto from our partner station KSAT introduces us to the first transgender military training instructor in the United States Air Force in tonight's local lowdown. Brandon Rodriguez is a military training instructor for the 321st Training Squadron at Joint Base San Antonio Lackland and has been serving for over a decade. I just hit 15 years uh, last month, June 13th of 2007. Serving as a military training instructor, a lifelong goal. This is something that I was fighting for for about six years and I finally, finally got here, so this means a lot to me. And it means a lot because... I enlisted as a female um, and I did my first, I want to say my first 10 years as a female. A San Antonio native, Brandon was born Brandy Rodriguez and formed part of an old school, traditional, loving Catholic family as the youngest of five. I knew that I was not who I was and I was born as a female. So making that uh, determination as a very young child put me in a, a mental space that wasn't conducive to a childhood life. 
As a teenager, he first came out to his family as a lesbian, but Rodriguez still wasn't feeling comfortable in his own skin. I was about 26 when I learned what the term transgender was, and all the way up until I was 26 years old, um, still thought I was probably the only individual that was thinking the way that I, I did. He says as a child, not having a mentor or someone to help was the most difficult time of his life. He had no other choice but to rely on his own strength and resiliency to survive. Having somebody support me and tell me it's gonna be, it's gonna be better. Everything's gonna be just fine. You know, not knowing that for so long was probably the most stressful, the most hurtful thing as a child. And it's not anybody's fault. It was just the time that we were living in. He started his transition in May of 2017 and says the biggest difference between Brandy and Brandon is his drastically improved mental health. This is who I am. And I've been searching for this person for a long time. Rodriguez is counted with endless support at the 321st training squadron and says at the end of the day, his heart, his passion, and his work ethic speak for itself. When I'm doing my job, nobody, nobody can tell. And nobody really cares, right? Can you do your job and can you do it well? Our thanks to Jonathan for bringing us that. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. America's number one news.